This is Speaking of Events, the podcast for event industry leaders. We bring together innovators, strategic rock stars, and visionary creatives to talk all about events, industry trends, and anything in between. And speaking of events, here is your host, Carrie Garbus. So I'm doing a show in Pennsylvania, and the guy I'm dating... Also, it turns out that I talk a lot about people I've dated in the past on this podcast. So it's also, it's yes, speaking of events, but also speaking of Carrie's past relationships. So it becomes a little bit of a therapy session. So thanks for hanging in there. So the guy I'm dating, I mean, I'm doing a show in Pennsylvania and the guy I'm dating says he wants to take me to the city, to New York city for our day off. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Except We can't stay at my apartment because I'm subletting because I'm here in Pennsylvania doing the show. And he's like, don't worry about it. I got us a room. I got us a room at the plaza. (gasps) And I'm like, what? You got us a room at the fancy plaza? I am stunned. I am excited. I call my mother and I'm like, mom, he's taking me to the plaza. And she's like, all right, be careful. I don't know what's going on. What, What actor can afford the plaza? Be careful. I'm like, okay, fine. So we take the train into the city and we, you know, get off at Penn Station and we start to walk. And we walk like two, three, four blocks, not very far. And he goes, Well, here we are. And I'm like, what uh this this is not this is not the plaza. The plaza is like over a couple blocks and up a couple blocks. And he's like, no, no, this is the plaza. And I'm like, no, it's not. And he's like, yeah, it's Milford Plaza. Uh, <laughs> so my guest different. is my guest is laughing because yes, they are very different hotels, the Plaza and Milford Plaza, very different places. Um, we did stay a very brief and rough night at the Milford Plaza. Uh, shortly thereafter, we broke up for varying degrees of reasons. And uh, it's too bad I didn't actually get my night at the Plaza because I would have met our guest many, many years earlier, possibly the man who has graced us with his time and his talents for the next chunk of an hour-ish. We'll see, I don't know. I am excited to introduce you to the man of many talents, as I said, and experience my guest today, David Kleiman, president of the Kleiman Group. So many things you are, have been MPIs, the international meeting planner of the year, named one of the most influential people in the meeting industries, the co-founder of the Events Industry Council Apex COVID Business Recovery Task Force. Why are you spending time with me, David? Thank you for joining me. (laughs) It's my pleasure. But I'll tell you, we have many mutual friends. And when someone like Dean Dean Amitrad at T-Mobile says, you guys need to connect. I'm going to return that email right away. Oh, so thank you. here I am. And yes, I started my career at the Plaza Hotel, not, not the Milford, Milford Plaza. Plaza. Very different. This is like first class on Singapore Airlines versus flying uh, Allegiant Spirit. Air. Spirit. <laughs> Spirit. Exactly. Have you ever flown? I doubt this, but have you ever flown Spirit? I have not flown Spirit. I've flown many budget airlines and I love Southwest Airlines because <gasps> I love they're Southwest. so good at what they do. Agreed. Um, but Spirit, no, I've never flown Spirit. Uh, yes. And most people I speak to say, I've flown Spirit once. Once. And I too have flown Spirit once and it was only half a trip because it was so tragic going there that actually when I got there, I changed my return flight to another airline. Yep. And we are no longer, uh, Spirit Airlines is no longer a sponsor of speaking of events, so we don't have to worry about it. That tanks, but but maybe- maybe you could get American Airlines or Singapore Airlines or- Ooh, Singapore or Southwest. We love Southwest. Southwest, we love Southwest. Or maybe 
uh, Lufthansa or Lufthansa. go figure. Okay, uh, you know what? I feel that we've flown off the, the jetway <laughs> of Let's this conversation so early. <laughs> what, you know you're gonna be in for a fun time. Thank you, thank you for being here. We uh, we have met a couple times now via Zoom before, and definitely a kindred spirits in some way since we we run a little bit in the same circle. So thank you very much. And Pleasure. my first question for you is, David, what is the one thing you wished more people knew about events? I wish more people knew about events, truly how they can be business game changing vehicles that can link to an organization's business objectives and the way an event truly has business or organizational meaning that goes beyond the stereotype of either a boring speaker or a party or a social event, but truly understand how a face-to-face -face event can change an organization. And if you think about major world events, I mean, we're right now in the Ukraine invasion crisis where Russia has invaded Ukraine. And this is, if you look, and I'm a student of history, if you look at the history of Europe, World War II is really key to that. And the United Nations, which was founded at the end of World War II, was founded at a face-to-face -face meeting in San Francisco at the Fairmont Hotel. Face-to-face -face meetings can change organizations and can help change the world. Boom. That is amazing. You are not, you are more than an event planner. I am. What, what it way more. What, what's your gig? What is, what do you yeah, do? So my gig is multifaceted. I range from facilitating think tanks, advisory boards, and focus groups that are populated by event professionals on behalf of DMOs, CVBs, hotel companies, airlines, tourism organizations. So kind of in that classic event space as a professional moderator and facilitator, but I also do deep dive research in the tourism space around regional economic development. I'm on a project next week around that. And I help organizations link their economic development objectives through tourism and meetings and events. And I've been an event planner. I was a corporate event professional for a very long time. So I've been on all sides of this. And I worked at the Plaza Hotel in New York. You, you did. <laughs> when I did not stay there, that's so <laughs> sad. When, so if we're thinking about global events, we had this thing, this COVID thing that now yes. has, we're kind of right at the two year mark. Yes, it was definitely around before, but I would yeah, say the- About the two year mark the global per pervasiveness of it at the two year mark. And it very much interrupted tourism and the event industry. Uh, Fully. Uh, maybe more uh, arguable, arguably more than other industries, if yes. I may be as so bold as to say that. So what do you see? We're at an exciting time. Things yeah. are churning, things are moving. What do you see going on in the reinvention of events, in the reinvention of tourism? What's Yeah, what's and, and, and it really is that for anybody, uh, many of us had a hope back in early 2020 when COVID hit the world that it would be short term and there would be a switch and we would start up again in, you know, 
take your pick six weeks, two months, three months, and we'll figure this out and we'll get back. That's not going to happen. We're, we're recording this in early March 2022. It's about 24 months since this happened, and there is no restart switch. What there is is real recovery, and we're seeing it. It started on the leisure side, both in the United States and around the world. Countries are opening up. If you look at Australia, New Zealand, that had closed borders, their borders are reopening to fully vaccinated visitors. It, specifically in the event space, there is real recovery. I've just returned. I'm a member of Meeting Professionals International Foundation uh, Board of Trustees, their board of directors. Um, and I've just returned from a joint meeting of the MPI International Board and the Foundation Board. We met earlier this week in Palm Springs, California, and there was real discussion about the recovery and reinvention of our industry. But it's not going to look the same. And what it's actually going to look like when this is all over, when hotels and convention centers are fully occupied on an ongoing basis, is still being invented. But the concept of using events as a key component of an organization's success strategy, as opposed to an add-on over there, that still stands. But there is a new ecosystem in the event world, which I would say is defined by flexibility. Because the old notions pre-COVID of having a plan and executing a plan and having a really good idea of what your attendee numbers are gonna be and what your business outcomes were are very different at the, hopefully at the tail end of the pandemic as we move into endemic reality. Organizations don't know exactly how many people are gonna attend. I'm at South by Southwest next week uh, in Austin, Texas. I was there in 2019 and the numbers were astronomical. I, I, don't quote me on the 2019 numbers, but it was you know, well into the many, many tens of thousands of people attending it. I have heard in talking with South by Southwest uh, leaders that their numbers are very strong, but they're probably going to be somewhere around approximately half of what they saw in 2020. Now, they'll have a successful meeting, I believe, but there's no way to just say we're going to convene and it's just going to look like it was before COVID because so many factors are still in place. And so flexibility, linking to organizational ob objectives, having a plan B, C, D, E, and F right. in terms of being able to not just pivot, but pirouette and really have flexibility is absolutely key. Thank you for using a ballet term to make me feel <laughs> so, comfortable. For, for an actress, a, a yes. actor, of course. Yes. I always, so you said pivot to pirouette, which for those who don't know, although I feel most of our audience is probably I knows what so. pirouette is, but it's, it's, it's a quick turn. It's a quick turnaround. And when in you know, kind of, I guess maybe in 21, people were saying, well, what is, what's your pivot? What's Ovation's pivot? And I said, we didn't do a pivot. We did a restaging. There you go. So that's how I, that's how I embraced that. Yeah. The, uh, so flexibility. Yes. That, uh, that it should be for everybody, that big takeaway from the past two years. Stay flexible. Absolutely. And, you know, you see it in so many ways. You see it on the supply side. If you talk to a hotelier or a supplier that is in the meeting space, a production company, a food and beverage company, a caterer, a hotelier, AV company, pre-COVID, if I was a, a leader at the fill-in-the-blank hotel company, I would be recruiting staff 
to work a 35 or 40 hour week and commit to five days a week and this amount of vacation and you fit into our system. Today, hotel leaders are recruiting people for flexibility. So if you want to be, as an example, a sous chef in the Omni Dallas, mm -hmm. and you're a stay-at-home mom that's looking for two hours a day, four days a week, and you can commit to eight hours a day, and you have skill as a sous chef, I'm here to tell you, you can find a job in the tourism space because suppliers understand that the, uh, the ecosystem of employment has changed. We've all spent two years pretty much in a Zoom environment, not everyone, but a lot. And we've realized that the old paradigm of 35 or 40 hours a week, five days a week is no longer the only way. It's one way, but it's not the only way to perform. Absolutely. Do you, and I know you don't have a crystal ball. I also feel if anybody has maybe a long lens, it's you. And reading, uh, I was reading some stats about, ironically, the airline industry and that they see themselves ramping up back to full pre-COVID capacity um, in 2023. Yes. Do you see the same thing in in events in tourism? I believe, and there's lots of research around this, that a full recovery, if we continue to move forward and nothing else from a, a medical scientific point of view around a pandemic uh, messes this up, that full recovery in the event space is probably more like 2024, 2025, because major conventions such as, let's say, a CES meeting in mm -hmm. Vegas with well over 100,000 people or Salesforce meeting in San Francisco with 150 plus thousand people, those large events are likely not to return in 2023, but more likely 2024 and 2025. Now, on tourism, leisure is back. So people are traveling on vacation. Um, there's exceptions to this. Um, the cruise industry is certainly suffering. But from the traditional meeting and event point of view, full recovery, I think, in the research really shows 2024, 2025 for full recovery. Makes sense. Thank you for sharing that. That's insightful, helpful, hopeful. 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 Absolutely. May we switch gears a little bit, David? Sure. Talk about talk about one of my favorite topics. Although this has been fascinating, I didn't want it to sound like I didn't enjoy that. That you know what you know what my company does. You know yes. we're the speaker coaching people. So and that's my obsession. And I was wondering if you had any. Uh, speaker, maybe disaster stories to share with us? Um, I haven't had disasters. So I was a meeting, I was a corporate meeting professional for a big financial services insurance company um, about 12 years full time doing that. And then I got a very lucky break and got promoted and became a senior officer, corporate communications exec with meetings and events under me. And through that entire time, I hired hundreds and hundreds of speakers. And um, I can't really say I've had disasters. I've had some interesting things. I hired a guy who is now famous, made famous by Leonardo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can, a fantastic speaker named Frank Abagnale, who as a young teenager and young man was an ace con artist 
portrayed by Leonardo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can. So here I am working for a financial services institution and I hire this guy and he is just the quintessential storyteller. And he gets up and he starts talking about, you know, I started um, kiting checks when I was 15. And by 16, I had figured out ways to con people out of this and that. And by age 18, I was faking my way as an airline pilot and writing jump seats on airlines all over the world and writing bad checks. And I'm looking at my audience of CEOs of insurance companies and financial service organizations squirming in their seats thinking, <laughs> what the hell are we listening to? And then he cuts to the chase of he served time in jail, he got out, and now he's a consultant to the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Treasury Department combating crime. Yes. And, but but the, the, the audience really squirming like, what am I, I'm listening to a con artist here. Um, that, that was a, a great memory. And I see him like he's got great YouTube videos to this day and is just a, a, a brilliant orator and storyteller. He is. And I am a huge fan of his. We didn't, I did not know you were going to share this no, story. No, we didn't talk and I about I love that. it. And I have a, a little baby connection to Frank Abagnale Jr. Because I did a production of Catch Me If You Can, the musical. Oh, oh yeah. So I played his mother, Paula. <laughs> sure. Right. You know, and in, in uh, a, a regional production. And then but also the woman who originated the role of his mother on Broadway, Rachel DeBenedict, is one of Ovation's trainers. Oh, there you go. And the gentleman who played my son in the show, who played Frank Abagnale Jr. in my production, now also works for Ovation. So we are all, all about Catch Me If You Can. No, yep. that is fabulous. Wow, that's pretty cool. All right, I can geek out on that pretty much all day. In terms of speakers that you've yes. seen at the massive amount of events mm -hmm. that you've run, gone to, et cetera, what is, what's, what's the one thing you wish speakers did that you're not seeing? Yeah, um, uh, the one thing that I really want speakers to do is to connect with their audience in a customized way. I have seen far too many speakers in the past, what I would call in one ear out the other. They're doing their manufactured uh, speech that they do really well and they might really have the great cadence and the great delivery and all of that, but it's just totally generic. And without doing the research and the, uh, I think a great thing that the great speakers do is they interview some audience members in advance and really try and understand what that audience wants to hear and know about and learn. Um, so being generic, I think is a death knell. Oh yeah. Oh, audience analysis is key. Absolutely. Key. Yeah. And e even, even if you can't for whatever reason, and this has happened to me when I have spoken at events, is I, I don't have access to these people for whatever reason. I'm, I'm hired right. Right, to come in. Yeah. If you can spend the afternoon before at the event, go meet of people, course. even five minutes before, what brought you to my session? Exactly. Why are you here? And what and if you're just in? out in the foyer of the hotel or the venue um, yes. anonymously, just talking to people? And, yes. and walking up, hey, you know, hey, my name is, you could even make up a name. You don't have to say you're the speaker, just work the room. I mean, understand. I would say, yeah, take take a note from Frank Abagnale and be like, I, I was your pilot. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm only 16, but yeah. And then go from there. I mean, that's a great conversation starter. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned and that you are a facilitator. I am. Right. That's that's what that's what you might say about yourself right now. You are. 
So what what makes a what makes a good facilitator? Well, like a great speaker, um, research and understanding what the stakeholders, whoever they are, the audience, the participants, who they are, what their pain points, what their pleasure points are, what they're looking to do, and also being able to read the room and read the audience and having that intuitive ability to pick up physical cues, verbal cl clues, just kind of the vibe of the room. And being intuitive and, and understanding that and really listening well and understanding that yes and. So when someone says, oh, this is what I think, or here's a suggestion, as opposed to just as a facilitator saying, oh, well, thank you very much and moving on, but really being able to ask that next question and the next question beyond it to drill down and connect those dots in a way that doesn't feel manufactured or forced, must feel natural, which gets other other people around the room to feel comfortable to participate. And of course, there's more, more to it, but th those are absolutely key. Yes, and yes, I am and. a huge fan of all the stuff you just mentioned, the awareness, the, the, yeah, I, the taking the information, adding it on and throwing it back. That's, yes. and that you is know, key. As, as an actor, I think you would know that improv can be a really interesting tool to move to the next place. And I think also in facilitation, having those improv improvisational skills and using some techniques from improv can be really useful as a facilitator. Imagine this, put yourself in this position and then act it out, speak it out, go there, draw it on a wall, build it physically, whatever it is, can be a really interesting exercise. Yes. This is actually when we get hired for some of the speaker coaching and people specifically want to work on the Q&A section. We teach improv techniques yeah. to uh, better handle the Q&A, more confidently, more cohesively handle that. So Yep. You're, you're singing my song, David. Hey, I'm singing your song. <laughs> I like it. How, speaking of songs. Yes. How, how, how did you get to be you? How does this, how does this happen? You're this global facilitator <laughs> expert. You are, you're, you're everything. You know, so here's my quick man. story. <laughs> so um, I raced my way through high school and took the summer off. And the agreement was, I'm gonna to go to college. Like that was the deal in my family. Gotta to go to college, gotta have an education's the most important thing after love and family and all that. So I had worked all my way through junior high school and had high school and high school and had a little bit of money. And I cut my long hair off and I got a backpack and I went to Europe for the summer. And I came home almost three years later. Wow. Having traveled all around, super cheap. I mean, the cheapest way you could possibly imagine. Youth hostels, sleeping outside, running out of money, getting odd jobs, working, traveling on freighters, all that. So the reason I say this is I got bit by the bug of travel. And if I turned my camera around, you would see a wall on the bookshelf behind me of 50 years of National Geographic. I grew up reading the National Geographic and due to this day because I was smitten by travel. So I'm on this kind of hippie trail traveling all over the world, come back, literally no hyperbole on a Sunday, 
and start college on a Tuesday. Did you have jet lag? Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, went to college. And all through that, I studied language, literature, German, Spanish, English, language, and lit. And with the objective of, I need to get a job in travel and tourism. I loved being on the road. Now I'm, you know, I'm not 17, 18 years old anymore. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to grow up and I need a job where I can travel. So I first thought airline industry. And that was really hard when I graduated college. And I got a lead for the Plaza Hotel in New York. And I literally walked into the employee's entrance and said, where can I apply for a job? And they hired me. Wow. And of course, I had aspirations. Oh, I want to be in sales. I want to be, I want to be in international sales. I speak three languages. I've lived all over the world. I've traveled. I can be a great sales guy. They're like, yeah, you and everyone else will hire you, wait for it, to be a reservation agent. And my boyfriend then, who is my husband today, many decades later, um, been together since then, said, nobody else offered you a job. Take the job. It's the Plaza Hotel. If you don't like it, you can leave in two months. It doesn't matter. I walked in there on the first day and fell in love with the hotel business, working there. And I was there for six years. During that time, I nurtured relationships. And I had a client who was the CEO of a little company you may have heard of called American Express. He was taking a company public, this insurance company that I went to work for, and out of the blue, one day offered me a job to be the meeting planner for this insurance company. No way. And two weeks later, I was there working for him at, for that company at the initial public offering. And I, again, thought, oh, if it doesn't work out, like I can leave in a year or two, big deal. I spent 18 years working there and changed my life. And it was great. Along the way was international chairman of MPI and was very dedicated to volunteer activities and very engaged in just not just my job, but the whole world of meetings, events, and tourism, had been on advisory boards for companies like United Airlines and um, uh, Hyatt Hotels and Starwood and others. And I brought that idea to the chairman, a different guy, and said, you know, we're doing all these meetings with these cool people where Frank Abagnale and other people are keynote speakers we should harvest more feedback at those meetings and I'll facilitate those meetings. And the chairman was like, that's a great idea, go do it. And I started facilitating think tanks internally for that company. I did that for many, many, many years. And then, you know, I had been there 18 years and I thought, I'm either gonna be here the rest of my life and I'm really a travel tourism hospitality guy. I'm really not an insurance guy. I've risen as far as I could go in this company. I was the chief communications officer reporting to the CEO. I mean, I wasn't going to become CEO of this $4 billion insurance company. That's not going to happen. It's not my skill set. So I quit my job and people thought I was crazy. I was going to Munich to the headquarters of the company six, seven, eight, ten times a year. I'm traveling all over the world. I'm in Singapore one week. I'm in Munich another. I'm going facilitating all these great meetings. I quit my job. People thought I was crazy. Best thing I ever did. And I nurtured that network that I had had since the Plaza Hotel all through my days at the insurance company and I put it out there and it, it just was like a gold mine. So 
long story, but the piece of advice that I would give is nurture and harvest your network. Be good to everybody. Treat every, you never know who's going to offer you a gig or hire you or open a door for you. And that's how I got to sit here and talk with you today. I cannot agree with you more. Thank you for taking us on that journey. Fantastical. I just made that up. I, it was that I don't know other, any other word other than that. You know, behind me on the bookshelf, I need yes. to turn around. I won't do it. I have a little world atlas. It's like this big, a little book. Uh -huh. And I carried that with me starting at age 17. And I highlighted everywhere I went in that two years and nine months or whatever it was. And it's sitting there. And Amazing. I was I was in North and South America, Africa, Europe, the Middle East, and the Far East. Wow. Like crazy. On that so crazy. little money you can't even imagine. It's admirable. Oh. A lean trip. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. David. Yes. We're gonna we're going to get off the airplane now for a moment. Get off the airplane. And we're getting on the train. And the train is called Lightning Express. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. We're gonna put 45 seconds on the clock. I'm gonna ask you eight questions and we're gonna get through them. Here oh. we go. One. What is your favorite moment in the event process? Ah, uh, execution, when it all comes together and you see it before you. Yes. What do you do every day to say, stay healthy and sane? Every night before I go to bed, I say out loud, think of the possibilities. Yes, you do. Out of the 126, 126 countries that you have been to, which is your favorite? Australia. Ooh. My love. Who do you consider your mentor? Mm. Well, my dad, for sure, age 92 and going strong. Yes. And I've had professional mentors. Um, Friends and people like Bruce McMillan, Chief Operating Officer at PCMA, who was also my first client when he was CEO at Tourism Toronto. And I look at mentors as not just peers or superiors, but also people that are younger than me. I look at our friend Dean. Every time I talk to Dean, who's probably... 25 years younger than me, I learned something. So it goes both ways. What is your favorite breed of dog? Oh, well, my puppy, my rescue standard poodle, Molly nice. girl, who's oh, sitting Monica. right over there. Oh, very, we should have made a peep. That's amazing. If, David, if we weren't talking, if you were not, not talking to me right now, what would you be doing? Um, maybe swimming, Ooh. but probably working, um, or, uh, stretching and lifting weights. Very nice. Would you kindly say, speaking of events in German? Ja, sprechen wir über Events und Meetings, ja. Können wir etwas sagen, ja. Ja. Yeah. And now Spanish, please. Yeah, über the, uh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> momentito, por favor. I have to switch the... Uh, I'm going to pass. I can't switch right now. Okay, you're I'm wonderful. Sorry, you Thank you. Me. No, yeah. I know. Well, it's the it's the lightning round. It's very it's high pressure. Round, yeah. It's it's <clears throat> difficult. The Blitz. German was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Donner und Blitzen auf Deutsch. Yes, so. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> What is your favorite thing to do when the event is over? Ah, so grabbing that extra bit of time, it could be an hour, it could be a day or a weekend, to be in that place and be done with the event and experience the destination as a visitor, as opposed to an event 
leader professional attendee. Wonderful. That brings us, congratulations. You're done with the lightning, lightning round. round. It was fabulous. Thank you so much. Here's what I want to end with, with you. Every night, and I knew this before, that you say, think of the think possibilities. Think of the possibilities. So, David, what is possible right now? I think it's possible right now to really engineer this reinvention not just for the events industry, but for the world and have hope and aspiration that we can in fact prevail as people, as humanity. I know it seems hard. Ukraine invasion puts like everything in question, but I think that we can reinvent and prevail. And I'm working towards that every minute. Thank you for that. We can prevail. Where, my friend, can people find you if they would like to connect with you? Yeah, just Google me, David Kleiman, K-L-I-M-A-N, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. LinkedIn is probably the best way. Um, or David at KleimanGroup.com. Reach out. Please do. Thank you. Thank you for the stories, the insight, the, the crystal ball. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Truly really my I'm pleasure. I'm looking forward to what we have going on this year, next year. I am so honored that we are now officially connected. We are connected. Had some chance, had some chance, had some moments to sit down and discuss. So Thank you for being here on Speaking really my of Events. Pleasure. Thank you to the listeners. You, I hope you gained as much uh, inspiration and knowledge from this past time as I have. And if you like events, if you love events, even if you loathe events, just tell someone about this podcast. And as always, whatever you are speaking about, remember to be Speaking of Events in any language, really. Thank you. Speaking of Events is sponsored by Ovation, the gold standard for professional presence and speaker development training, helping everyone get prepared, get confident, and get Ovation.